Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. This podcast is for the fourth Sunday of Advent, which falls on December 22nd, 2024. And our first reading is Micah 5, verses 2 through 5a. The psalm can be either Psalm 80, 1 through 7, or you can read the Magnificat, Mary's song, in Luke 1, 46b through 55. The epistle reading is Hebrews 10, 5 through 10, and the gospel text is Luke 1, 59 through 45, or you can read all the way through 55, which then also incorporates the Magnificat. So this is confusing, so I'm going to say it in a way that hopefully explains it to myself. We're going to talk about the entire Lucan text, including the Magnificat, and then you're also prepared for Magnificat as the Psalm. We are not going to talk about Psalm one, Psalm number 80, because uh, there's just only so much time in the world. And my last announcement before the church service can begin is uh, you're probably expecting to hear Joy Moore's voice, as were we. Uh, Joy was unable to make it today, and because of our scheduling, uh, we're going ahead and uh, and riding with just the two of us, um, and Joy sends her regards. She will, of course, be back for future podcasts once we get through the Christmas holiday. But this is just a, a scheduling snafu behind the scenes, but the podcast must go on. It must go on. We we carry on. Did I explain all of that? That's a lot of stuff. That was a lot of stuff, but you did great. All right, let's get to Luke 1 then. We are the last Sunday of Advent, which typically is kind of an annunciation, like, let's get this party started. Uh, we know Jesus is going to be born, even though we haven't really talked about him much mm -hmm. for the first three Sundays of Advent, at least not talking about his birth. And so now, here you go, uh, a lovely story. I don't mean lovely in a condescending way, but this beautiful story where Elizabeth and Mary get together to compare notes. It is a beautiful story and and such a an intimate story between these two women. Uh, so personal and the way in which their stories are intertwined here. And I just I just love it. And I I love the fact that you have Elizabeth in this just small piece really is this prophet, right? Who she's filled with the Holy Spirit and is able to see the truth of who Mary is and what Mary is going to, her, the birth of her son, what that's going to bring about. Uh, so you have this act of prophecy that, that, uh, that Elizabeth is announcing. She, she, offers a beatitude to uh to Mary as well uh that uh, this is actually in uh the 45 is is blessed is makarios i uh, and blessed is she who believed i want to talk about that in a bit uh, but how is it then that in part hearing hearing that beatitude that's one reason we have one one of the reasons for Mary's Magnificat there's a response to hearing happy are you or blessed are you um, so it's just those are just some places that I that I began in this story of what what does it what does it feel like to hear those words that uh, blessed are you and of course we'll get that with uh, the the um, Beatitudes in Luke later on in chapter six. But what is your response to hearing those words, I think is one, uh, one way to interpret the Magnificat. Yeah, excellent. I wanna know what you have to say about verse 45 about she who believed, because I was gonna say something on that as well. Oh, you were gonna say something? No, you go ahead and then I'll, because no, I just well talked. I just talked, so you go ahead. <laughs> It doesn't have to work that way. It doesn't have to be back and forth. But, Fine. well, it's, uh, I, I read that this time and I thought, that's interesting. Like Mary's a believer and a lot has been, a lot of this package, this passage has received a lot of attention in the last couple of decades. And in, 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 in my experience, in terms of how I see this passage written about and when I teach it, which I do frequently, there's been a lot of energy given to Mary's interaction with Gabriel 
as a sign of consent on Mary's part or acceptance on her mm. part, mm. which is, of course, incredibly important, right? What's Mary's role in this? Is Mary just a vessel for God to use or is mm. Mary, how is Mary playing a part? And this is a reminder that Mary's more than just a consenting agent. She's a believer mm -hmm. and that's, mm -hmm. it, she can be both. She can be all of these. And mm -hmm. so I, I really want to be, careful that in trying to add dignity and agency to Mary, we don't limit that, the scope of that. Mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. also recognize that she is somehow on board with the fact that God is doing something here, that she believes a fulfillment is taking place. And that's incredibly important mm -hmm. language mm -hmm. in Luke and in Acts, especially the right. early chapters of both. Right. That God is keeping promises. Yeah. And that requires mm -hmm. insight, mm -hmm. but it also requires belief, which I would even gloss again as trust. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I, what I was going to say is that, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And then what she believes and how that is getting fulfilled is the Magnificat. And so what, what, you know, Mary connecting the dots of what's happening with her, but the way in which she then sees, uh, she sees the enunciation to her. And then this moment with Elizabeth as a fulfillment of really God's character of the kind of God she's always known, uh, who now, who has, uh, puts her in that generational promise, right? For surely now on all generations will call me blessed. But she goes back to, and you know, verse 45, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever, that she sees herself in that, uh, that, that generational promise of blessedness, blessed to be a blessing. And so it, 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 that, I, that's just so remarkable that she makes I mean, not surprising, but that she, but that we acknowledge that, uh, that that's really one way to think about the Magnificat is the content of that belief. And then how she is, what does fulfillment look like? Uh, not only for her and in this moment, but uh, a preacher would do well to come, keep coming back to this and to say, what does fulfillment look like in the gospel of Luke? That's looking ahead of ourselves as we move into year C, but it's all here. Mary gets it. Right. That's it right. All. Mm -hmm. It's a character sketch of who God is, but even more so it's Mary knitting her own experience into that and mm -hmm. seeing that what's mm -hmm. happening around her, through her, in her, because of her is, is part of the way in which this disruptive God is at it again. And that's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that makes it more than just theology delivered from a distance, right? It's very much prophetic that she's in the, in the throes of the action, so to speak, and is an agent in the action. Yeah. And the, the idea of also the Magnificat being, uh, being a response to that, hearing that blessedness, uh, blessed, uh, first, you know, blessed are you among women and then, um, blessed in terms of what she believes. And the fact that the Magnificat is the way in which she articulates that. And, um, and so, so clearly, um, and, and the, and also the, we talked about that we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this, I think going forward, but, particularly the idea of mercy, um, that seeing that, seeing that this is part of what this is revealing is the character of God as a merciful God. And so, like you said, Matt, it's this, it is a confession. It's a confession of God's character. Um, and, uh, and are, are we listening for what she has to say about who she knows her God to be? Uh, and, I, I also have uh, asked people about this uh, when it comes to the Magnificat and particularly, you know, this is the last Sunday of Advent and moving into Christmas. Uh, if you had to sing your own Magnificat, praising God for what God has done for you, what would you say? 
uh, how how would you articulate that? So you invite people into this kind of responsive praise commentary on who God is that I think could be meaningful for people to imagine. Yeah, what how would how would you respond to these words of blessedness by your cousin um, and 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 uh, and response to because in many respects Elizabeth confirms what what Mary has already heard but how important it is for her to hear from Elizabeth as well what's ha- happened to her do you know what I mean so it's it's, it's I remember it makes- talking about that either a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, I think it was a commentary from Raj Nadella and I haven't looked this up, but I just remembered, I remembered you commenting on it yeah. several years ago, that part of what's going on here is Elizabeth is giving Mary the encouragement or the courage or the companionship that she might need in this moment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Is my memory that correctly? Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I do keep, and we did talk about that and I keep coming back to that. Uh, and, and so it, what Mary hears, I mean, the Magnificat becomes mm, that we think of the Magnificat as in a much broader sense. I, uh, and, and because it's, it's, I think it's easy to kind of lift it out and, uh, and isolate it from, from the content or from the context. Right. Uh, and, and really what, what surrounds the Magnificat, of course, is uh, is the visit to Elizabeth, but then, of course, the the birth of John. And so Elizabeth really surrounds the Magnificat, but then you have to what extent Mary's Magnificat is a response to what's happened to her um, in, with the Annunciation. So how can we have a broader interpretation of this, of these words? Because like I said, it's so easy to lift it out because it has been lifted out, Ave Maria, you know, or the, like the, admit, the way, it, not the Ave Maria, but the way in which the Magnificat gets, uh, gets put into, you know, different kinds of choral settings and all of that. And, yeah. and, but, but really hearing it in the response to Elizabeth, the encouragement of Elizabeth uh, to give witness to the entirety of what's happened to Mary so far. Yeah, let's... Um... We have we have a little time to devote to the Magnificat in a little more detail, don't we? Yeah. So if people don't know, Magnificat is just the first word in the Latin version and traditionally right. has been known as the Magnificat. And there's a lot of history around this. Some of it's actually even true. Um, <laughs> like there's, a, there's an urban legend that this was somehow uh, made illegal to to proclaim or to sing in churches and so mm-hmm. in certain Latin American countries. I, I've never been able to find any mm-hmm. support for that. I don't think that's true, but anyway, there's, there are, it has its own kind of mythos that surrounds it. And some of that is because it is such a statement of, of overturning, you know, it's often mm-hmm. referred to as Luke's penchant for reversals. Right. And there certainly is a lot of that, especially in verses 52 and 53, but there's more to the song than that as well. It's very much, I think, a um, it's a statement of about a God who's not going to let Israel get pushed around anymore. And I, I want to gloss that too. And that it's, it's I, I'm talking about Mary's experience and Mary's time, and this idea of of you know generation from generation, but also then especially verses 54 and 55. This idea of of this promise made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to Abraham's descendants forever. Like these are the things that are true. And to get Mm -hmm. there, God apparently has to go through Hmm. verses 51 through 53. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? There is a, so this -hmm. is really important to Luke, both in the gospel and in the book of Acts, Mm -hmm. that God is being true to every promise God has ever made to the people of Israel from time immemorial and that the gospel of Jesus Christ is in no way a break from that as much as a manifestation or a flower yeah. of that. Yeah. That continuity. Mm-hmm. Right. And so then you have to think about Mary and where she sits under Roman occupation. You have to go back and even look at the mismanagement of the Hasmoneans. You have to go back to the Maccabean revolt and the Seleucid dynasty. I mean, you have to mm-hmm. get a sense of the beleagueredness of, 
mm-hmm. um, what her exp- the way she's giving voice not only to her own experience but to the experience of a nation. Yes, that's fed up. Yeah, and and I mean this is a a wider trajectory. I mean this is a longer trajectory going into the year of Luke, but the way in which the Magnificat also just sets up all the themes of Luke. I mean it it it's. It's uh, to keep coming back. I mean, I already know that I'm going to keep coming back to, <laughs> yeah, to the Magnificat over and over again. And, and when we get to Jesus' uh, speech in Nazareth, right, his sermon in Nazareth. I mean, it's just you know, basically the Magnificat retold through Isaiah. Yeah, you know, say more about was, some of those themes. Is that just because it's reversal and you know? Yeah, reversal praise, right? Uh, that we see throughout the uh, that who who God sees, uh, that, that recognition of that she has been seen, uh, she has been regarded. And then that's a theme in Luke. Like we're out, we're, we're invited to have that perspective of God, of who, we, who, who we will see, will we see as God sees, will we see as Jesus sees, um, and you know, the cast of characters that are unique to Luke that, that most people would overlook, you know, the widow of Nain, that kind of thing. So, uh, yeah. And, uh, and the, uh, yeah. And like you said, the reversal, the upside downness, I think that's another one. So yeah, we'll just, we'll just keep coming. And my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. So the role of the Holy spirit and yeah. Yeah. That's all great. It's kind of all here. I think too, of the way in which Luke refuses to be spiritualized, you know, when you think mm. of like the sermon on the plane in Luke chapter six, right which begins with blessed are you who are poor. It's not yeah. blessed are the poor in spirit. So yeah. like Luke's like, don't even think about trying to like <laughs> making this no. about spiritual poverty. I'm no. talking about real poor people. And I think there's something about what Mary says too, that refuses Absolutely. to be spiritualized or refuses to be, you know what I mean by spiritualized? Am I using the right word there? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And he has filled the hungry with good. Th- there it is. The hungry with good things. Right. Yeah. Well, I'm spiritually hungry. No, <laughs> no, that's not going to, that's not going to work for Luke. And so for some people, this song is not about you. Yeah. Is that fair to say? Is that mean? What I just think on the top of my head. Well, it's about God. And if it's about God, therefore it's about you. But yeah. I do think verse 53, <laughs> verses 52 and 53, are are not about me unless they're about me being uh, stripped of my my sense of my own self importance and my own comfort. Mm-hmm. And if that's that's not punitive, I think mm-hmm. that's about saying all of you folks who have been denied basic mm-hmm. aspects of dignity, like food and self determination and control mm-hmm. over one's own self and one's own body, or you God sees you and God's going to restore. Mm-hmm. what's been taken mm-hmm. from you or what's been denied you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I say it's not about me. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. 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 Uh, one other comment, and then we should go on to um, Micah and Hebrews, but I, I, it's not included in the lectionary, but it's, it's worth just kind of sitting in the detail of the fact that Mary remained with her about three months. Mm. I basically remained with her until, it, it, I mean, and then returned her home, but basically remained with Elizabeth until the birth of, right before the birth of John. Yeah. Uh, and that, I I love that too, because it reinforces their relationship and their companionship. And it, for me, it invites sort of a Midrashic imagination of what they talked about and how, sure. they, how they lived together for those three months as, uh, as uh, Mary is pregnant and- and it's in the beginning stages of her bre- pregnancy and Elizabeth is at the end stages of her pregnancy. And yeah, I just think that that's, I don't know. It's very touching for me. I don't yeah. Know. What do you think they talked about? Uh, lots of things. <laughs> I imagine they heard some whispering. Yeah. Like, can you believe well, how old she is? Yeah. Can you believe how young she is? And, exactly. Well, but Yeah. Uh, yeah. and that, yeah, but they were together in all of it. Right. And I love the fact that it's not Mary says the Magnificat. And then we go immediately into now it take, now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth. We're just given this three month space to say, 
And then what happened with all of this? You know, what, uh, and I love that narrative space there that invites us into, yeah, what were those three months like yeah. between the two of them? Yeah. It's not that, and so it, so it, that for me also makes a difference for the Magnificat, that it's not just this sort of uh, one time response to what's happening, that it's this, it's this ongoing sort of, um, stance of mm. or way of being because of what God has done if that makes any sense at all I just that's what I hear in that's verse fi- verse 56 yeah. yeah excellent all right Micah apparently there's more to Micah than six eight what <laughs> there's also <laughs> five two to five a such a great verse <laughs> indeed <laughs> Um, the commentary is helpful to get a sense of the the context, of course, of of Micah, and that's important because, of course, Micah is more than one verse or these few verses about Bethlehem. It is it is uh, a larger right the prophecy from Micah in a really um, challenging period in Israel's history. So we want to pay attention to that, uh, and but of course it's as the commentary said, invites us to look for God's presence where we least expect and to be attuned to the voices of the small, the powerless and the vulnerable. And so uh, the way in which you might want to bring in Micah, particularly in, in preaching on the Magnificat, because that's, that's exactly what Mary recognizes. Yeah. Yeah. And how some of this is happening under the radar. Mm-hmm. Or establishing itself under the radar. You know, this is not the way you would announce a king or a ruler who's yeah. um, now eventually towards the end, right? Yeah. He shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord. They shall live secure. He shall be the one of peace. Uh, mm-hmm. are interesting. But yeah, the way this, this story builds mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. under the radar, from subtlety to, to majesty. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. It's certainly interesting. So that's that's one of the one of the ways I would think about Micah. I don't know that I I probably wouldn't preach on it honestly because this because the visitation is so beautiful, <laughs> but it but it does give witness to the kind of God that Mary knows the the characteristics of God that 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 Mary praises. So it does. It's a reminder that messianism is in the air all throughout Luke 1 and 2. Everybody seems to be ready for Jesus to come. Everybody seems to be excited for Jesus to come. Nobody needs an explanation like what's the messiah? What are you talking about? Why do we need this? You know, every it's mm-hmm. the stage is set and Micah is one of the stage setters as, yeah. as Luke imagines. It. Absolutely. Yeah, none of this is not happening in a vacuum. <laughs> Um, no, yeah. but what makes Luke one and two so weird is that it's almost a dreamscape. It's mm, kind of mm-hmm. like, where did all these perfect people come from? Mm-hmm. <laughs> where did all these insightful prophets come from? Mm-hmm. You know, there's no, there's no, the only thing that's, that's close to opposition is Zechariah is a little too much of a dunderhead to, mm-hmm. but then it's, they take care of him. No problem. Like, all right, stop speaking. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's not until Simeon speaks where you realize, ooh, this is going to be a hard story. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, Hebrews, what would you do with Hebrews 10, 5 to 10? Well, who saw this coming? I mean, Hebrews is an interesting, you know, uh, there's no subtlety here. This is dumping a lot of heavy theology into into your mm-hmm. lap on, on Advent 4. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's a creative look here at, at Psalm 40. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, the, I, I think verses eight through ten have a supersessionism warning attached to them, or they should have a supersessionism warning yeah, attached. Yeah. That this is not about abolishing Judaism or declaring Judaism misguided in its worship right. or its practices. So, yeah, if you read all of Hebrews ten, if you bring it up, you need to. Glo- I think you need to gloss that. Mm-hmm. I would focus in on verse seven. Mm. See, I have come to do your will, O God. Mm. And this is, you know, Hebrew, the author of Hebrews sticks this psalm in the mouth of Jesus, where Jesus is the speaker mm-hmm. of the psalm. Jesus is the one saying, I have come to do your will, O mm-hmm. God. And that's an interesting mm-hmm. way of defining this Messiah after we've had one Sunday of end of the world language. We've had two Sundays of John the baptizer. Right. And who's this person who's going to come and clean house? 
I've come to do your will, oh God. This is somebody trustworthy. I like that. And uh, and it it does then invite a sense of, see, I have come to do your will, oh God. So imagining, and, and of course the passage says it twice, but uh, and it is by God's will that we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And so it invites imagination thinking into, well, what is that, what is that will going to look like? How is, how is Jesus going to embody that will or, or, or work it out? Um, what is God's will? And, uh, and I think for the fourth Sunday of Advent, you could do something along those lines of saying, um, what, what do we hear on the fourth Sunday of Advent in terms of what is God's will? Um, what is God's will for the world? What is God's will for us here and now? Uh, what difference does it make to claim that part of what God's will is about is uh, the birth of Jesus? Uh, and and I, it could cast a little bit different understanding of what of how we understand what is God's will, uh, which gets said a lot, right? And well, it was God's will, it was God's will, God's will. Well, what, what does that really mean? Um, and how does this, how does this passage, particularly on the fourth Sunday of Advent, maybe cast that in a different way for people? Sure. The Magnificat might be God's will. There's all sorts of like mm -hmm. ways you can invite people to look for that in the the hymnody of Advent and Christmas, and in the texts they're going to hear on the twenty fourth and twenty fifth. Exactly. And happy Advent. Happy Advent. Always the best season of the year for me. I know. Yeah. I know. I'm sorry. It's moving on, but. Don't blink or you miss it. That's right. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.